Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of FP Next. I'm one of your co-hosts, Sarah McNaught, and I'm here with Kurt Arns. Hi, Sarah. Glad to be with you here today. And uh, how's everything up in Bismarck? You know, it's pretty good. I can't complain. We had almost 60 degree weather here and we're recording in January, of course, but super, super excited about those nice temperatures. Are you guys get rid of some of that snow you got a couple weeks ago down in Nebraska? Well, we're, we're starting to. Yeah, we've had some really nice weather uh, this week, but last week was a real, real uh, blizzard type week. So uh, it's uh, good to see temperatures that are a little more moderate and we're going to get rid of a little bit of the snow. But for you up in Bismarck, that's a little unusual this time of year, I guess, huh? It's very unusual. I think I saw that out on the eastern side of the state. It was a record for the warmest day in January. But that just means the other foot's going to drop pretty soon and we're going to be back in <laughs> blizzard conditions in the negative 30s. So really, we're enjoying it while we can. Enjoy the weather while you can. That's right. Well, I'm really excited for our Definitely. special guest today. And, and I think the topic we have on the table is pretty important to a lot of farmers. It'll be pretty interesting. So the title of our deep dive episode today is The Wild West of Crop Biologicals. And we chose that because it really is like the Wild West out there trying to figure out if crop biologicals live up to the hype and to be able to navigate the hundreds of products out there to decide if any of them will boost yields and pay for themselves in the field. Yeah, producers have enough to worry about these days. And this is really something that seems to work for many producers. But then others are kind of frustrated that the biologicals they're using may not always pay for themselves. You know, is it worth the money? I mean, that's the bottom line. And that's why we have Nebraska's on-farm research program coordinator, Laura Thompson, with us today, who can help us understand when to employ biologicals, how to choose what might work, and how to conduct your own studies in your own fields to kind of figure that out. Yes, Laura is a Nebraska Extension Ag Technologies and Cropping Systems Educator based in the southeast part of the state. She's been the coordinator for Nebraska's on-farm research network for the past several years, and she works every day with farmers and agronomists and answering crop production questions and helping provide education opportunities regarding ag technologies like precision agriculture, data management, and drones. Laura, welcome and thank you so much for being here with us today on FP Next. Thanks, guys. I'm excited to be visiting with you today. We're definitely excited, Laura. And before we get into the nuts and bolts of biologicals and the on-farm research network, we wanted to get our listeners to get to know you a little bit first. So how long have you been coordinating the on-farm research network in Nebraska, and how did you come into this position in the first place? Yeah, so I've actually been in this role for uh, going on 10 years now, so quite a, a little while, and came into this role right out of grad school, right as I finished my master's degree. Um, so I had been working at the University of Nebraska Nebraska on my master's in precision nitrogen research. And uh, this kind of position opened up and I was really interested in the diversity that the position offered, uh, the opportunity to work with farmers, really working close uh, on research questions that are practical for farmers, things that really impact their bottom line, their day-to-day -day operations, um, doing research that I knew would, would have an impact and would have relevancy to farmers in Nebraska. So I was really excited about the opportunity to do this role, as well as help producers start to leverage more of the ag technologies that they have in their own operations to do on-farm research. So that's really been gaining momentum and kind of was getting started at that time. People were starting to see more possibility to utilize things like our variable rate applications and our yield monitors to do studies, and that there would be a benefit in convenience for producers to do this, as well as uh, allowing us to conduct studies more complicated studies, studies in different environments, and gain more information on a spatial basis within fields. So a lot of opportunity there. And so because of my interest in precision ag and digital ag, I thought this would be a good fit, allowed me to use those skills and continue to grow my skills in that area to help producers leverage that to conduct on-farm research. So that's really kind of my, my background in getting into this position, and I uh, really have enjoyed it over the last 10 years. So Laura... We know that part of your job gets you out in the field with ag drones. At Nebraska Farmer, we've used a University of Nebraska photo of you flying a drone in a field in some of our stories about on-farm research. So you, can you tell us just a little bit about how you came to flying drones and maybe tell us about your first day as a drone pilot and how that went and how you use drones today in the field? Yeah, so I kind of had some really early interest and in exposure in drones. Uh, actually, dating back, to, I'm not sure 
sure what year, but it would have been, oh, maybe around 2005 to 2008, quite a while uh, before commercial options started becoming available and regulations started coming into place. Um, We had a family friend who was interested in kind of demoing a drone he was developing on a farmer field and trying to learn about farm use cases. So we were kind of the test bed at our family farm for that. So I had some really kind of earlier exposures to it and kind of that interest in having that bird's eye view and seeing what that would mean for helping us manage crops and crop scouting. And I guess kind of not to get too into the weeds here, but also had the opportunity growing up, my dad uh, fl- flies a powered parachute and we use that to scout fields. So I grew up flying along with him to doing that. So not a drone and actually pretty fun to be up there yourself and seeing it with your own eyes rather than standing on the ground, but kind of had some early influences and exposures into that idea of having that bird's eye view. So yeah, when the regulations started to come into place, uh, I think 2016 was when that started getting in place. I was really eager to uh, get going with that. And I think right away that that fall took my test and purchased a drone and started experimenting with what we could do with it. Had a lot of opportunity to do that through our on-farm research fields, looking at things like crop scouting, but also was really interested in how we could use things like multispectral cameras to see beyond what our eyes can see, uh, that near infrared portion of the spectrum. And a lot of my more in-depth work has been looking at how we can use them and that multispectral sensor for nitrogen management. So uh, that has a lot of importance uh, in Nebraska as well as you know other areas of the country, but getting that nitrogen management piece as precise as we can and looking at that opportunity. So that's uh, primarily how I've used used them uh, to this day and, you know, still enjoy uh, uh, that. But also, I guess, you know, just on a more casual side, do enjoy creating videos and photos and kind of the the creative side of it as well. So it's been fun to produce some videos for our family farm, capturing things like harvest and planting and and putting together some videos and photos um, from that perspective. Laura, have you ever crashed a drone? I know a lot of farmer pilots who have. I've definitely heard some stories like that. Yeah. And or the fly offs where they just, you know, uh, right. fly away. It's never to be seen again. Um, <laughs> uh, thankfully, I guess I haven't had anything super dramatic myself. Uh, the worst case would just be some not so graceful landings, I guess, or things <laughs> like that. Catching the edge of a corn plant and, you know, kind of mulching the corn plant on the way down or something <laughs> like that. But uh, nothing super dramatic, thankfully. Oh, gosh, you know, with how expensive those systems are, I'm glad to hear there haven't been any big crashes or anything like that. Uh, so getting to topic at hand, Laura. First off, can you explain a little bit about what biologicals and biostimulants are, what crops are available for, and then also how they work? Yeah, there's a lot of different products that we categorize as biologicals or biostimulants. And even, you know, in our on-farm research network, a lot of times we we kind of look more generally at what we call non-traditional products. And so uh, these could be things like biologicals, biostimulants, as well as other things. But we're looking at products here that are being derived from natural materials, beneficial microorganisms. These could be things like bacteria or fungi. Also products like seaweed extracts, amino acids, humic acids, um, organic compounds. Um, So regardless, the idea is really to try to uh, stimulate or Um, interact with the plant and the soil to help promote growth, could be increasing nutrient uptake. There's a variety of different reasons that producers might try to or be interested in utilizing these products and have gained, uh, as you noted, a lot of attention recently. And so a lot of those, um, I think, reasons for that is that interest in reducing chemical inputs, the emphasis on how can we improve soil health, more emphasis on promoting more sustainable farming practices. So these products really kind of fit into that um, interest in thinking about how can we utilize these natural products to do that. Um, And I guess towards the crops, you asked about, you know, really they're they're available for a wide variety of crops. So here in Nebraska, we're thinking about 
generally corn, soybeans, uh, dry edible beans, but they are also available for high value crops or horticultural crops, things like that. So really uh, are available for, for a wide variety. So tell us a little bit about some of your most recent studies that you're aware of regarding the utilization of crop biologicals and biostimulants in the field. We know from the 2022 On Farm Research Network results publication that farmers in Nebraska have been doing a lot of studies, different studies, especially with products like Pivot Bio, for instance, but there's a lot of others as well, right? Yeah. So we've had uh, producers testing a lot of different products over the years and uh, not just, you know, in the last couple of years, but dating back for many years. Um, so there's been different products available uh, over the years. And one of the benefits of doing that research through our on-farm research network is that we have a nice repository of those studies available now. We have a, what's called our results finder database where you can search and filter by different products or product names or this kind of category and look at how those different products are performing for different people in different parts of the state and different production systems. So there's a lot of different studies that people have been looking at, some utilizing commercial products products, like you mentioned, some there like Pivot Bio, as well as other products sourced by Sound Ag, um, you know, a, a large variety of different products being tested over the years. And then some producers looking at uh, their own products as well. Uh, so really, uh, there's been just a huge variety over the years, you know, as those products have changed, come into the market, and sometimes left the market or been re rebranded. It's great to have such a nice uh, repository of studies to be able to look back into and see how they're performing. I know I love to look at those research studies when it comes to new products, just a little bit of a science nerd to see how those things actually work and how they can bring benefits to farmers. And actually, there are some farmers that are producing their own biologicals from compost extra extracts to boost soil microbes through homemade seed treatments or post plant applications during vegetative stages on corn. And I think that's something that's been studied through the on-farm network research as well, right? How can producers evaluate the impact of these products on nutrient uptake? Yes. So we've had some really innovative farmers looking at that. And that's one thing that's really fun about our on-farm research network is that it's very uh, farmer driven. So um, in some cases, um, research is coming kind of from the perspective of the researchers and just the topics that they want to see done. Uh, but we have such a huge variety of studies being done in our, our network because we have all the, the innovative and curious farmers um, across the state uh, coming up with their different topics and, and things that they're interested in looking at. And we're working with them on those studies. Um, so one of the things that I really like about how these farmers that are, are developing their own um, composter extracts and applying those to the soil, uh, how they're doing these studies is that they're really focusing on it as a systems approach. So they're not just looking at the impact of that product, but they're looking at how does this impact their fertilizer application, their synthetic fertilizer application. Uh, how much they need, uh, how does this impact how much herbicides they're needing, uh, how does this impact their soil health. So they're really trying to look at it as a systems approach. And as part of that, they're really trying to look at it over a longer term. And so, again, that's a really great benefit when the um, impetus for the study is coming from the farmer. They have that motivation. And often uh, we see producers carrying out the same study and maintaining, you know, strips where they're applying this product and then check strips where they're not and they're maintaining that for many, many years. So that can be a limitation in the research setting that often our grant funding or things like that restrict us to maybe only a couple years of a study. Uh, but these producers are really interested in seeing how this impacts over the long term. And that's really beneficial because, you know, as we think about this being a biological, we know that that takes time in a system to, to make a difference and for the system to adapt and, and change and to really start to measure what the implications might be in terms of uh, synthetic fertilizer application, herbicide application, things like that, soil health. And so that's really exciting to see these producers have that interest and commit to doing this over, over multiple years. So I think some are, maybe we're going on to now two or three years into the study, but I'm really, you know, even more excited to see what some of these look like uh, 10 years down the road as these producers continue with that research on their farms. So Laura, with all the biologicals on the market today, I mean, where do you start out? to figure out what might actually work on your own farm? How do you decide 
whether it'll pay off or not in the long run? Yeah, that's a great question. And really, you know, the big question is, you know, how do we how do we figure out what to use? How do we figure out uh, what's going to work in our operations? And knowing that we have such different um, conditions, weather conditions, soils, landscapes, um, management practices. So that's where um, doing on-farm research, I think, is the most beneficial for, for producers. And it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, very complicated um, to do that. But, you know, really, as you're thinking about adopting a new product into your operation, I think it's really critical that producers are getting data on how that product is performing. We probably, you know, come with our bias. If we've purchased that product, we want to see it work. Um, And if we're just kind of anecdotally looking, applying it to the whole field and kind of going with a gut feeling, I think we naturally would have a bias that we we paid money for this product. We want to we want to see something, whether it's there or not. And so I think that's really where coming at it from a perspective of we need to test this before we adopt it across our whole operation is really important. And so maybe you do that test on a couple fields. And, you know, maybe it's even stepping back and saying, I've implemented this on a lot of fields in the past, but maybe this is the year I put some check strips in and get that data for myself. You know, it's not too late to, to step back and, and collect that data for yourself. And, you know, maybe you're going to see that that your gut feeling was correct, or maybe it's not what you what you thought. But that's really, I think, where we're going to to get that data that's going to allow us to have confidence and know if that product is performing and doing what we think it's going to do. So, you know, a a number of considerations with that. Um, We need to set up the tests well. But really, I think some of that importance is thinking about your management. You know, other people might test these on their farms uh, and get different results. And that's because our farms, our management systems are different. No till, till the landscape, the the slopes, the temperatures, you know, all these things factor in and it's a very complex system. And so getting that information for yourself is going to be the most valuable, I think. So then Laura, kind of adding to that question, how can producers evaluate the impact of these products on their nutrient uptake in their fields? Yeah. So as we think about these trials that producers can set up, you know, we talked about doing some simple with and without the product, and that's a great starting point. But a lot of these products are looking at things like providing nitrogen to the crop, right? And so we need to look at this kind of within the system. And so we need to look at more than just with and without the product. That's a great starting point. But with our precision ag technology, what we're seeing a lot of producers in Nebraska doing to evaluate this is look at those products at a range of nitrogen rates. So we can actually set up a variable rate nitrogen prescription that can go in at the time of fertilization and apply a range of nitrogen rates. It's maybe uh, ranging from uh, 75 pounds to 200 pounds of nitrogen. You know, that range can be different, but we'd have several rates. And then we're looking at the impact. Uh, we're applying the product, the biological product across those rates, and then we're leaving a check without the biological product across those rates as well. As well. And so that's really helping us look at the impact. Um, one of the challenges I think producers faced in the first couple years of testing these products was they would do a test without or with a reduced nitrogen rate and maybe not see any impact for that product, which is, of course, can be discouraging for the producers. But we we don't know, you know, what that if that nitrogen rate that they were testing at was already in excess of that optimum nitrogen rate. So that's why uh, we're really trying to work with producers to test across a wider range of nitrogen rates and see what the impact might be looking at our optimum nitrogen rate without the product and with the product um, and really get giving a chance to see where that product might fit. Another benefit of doing this kind of variable rate approach and putting in a prescription like this is we can test it in different geographies within the field. So maybe we've got some silty clay loams and maybe we have a sandy pocket of the field and we can see if we have any differences. And so, you know, in some cases we're, we're still seeing that we're not having an impact of these products, but that's really the, the depth of the test that we need to do to be able to verify if that is or isn't the case for each producer in each region of the field. And really, you know, I just also want to emphasize, you know, it can be discouraging when testing these products for growers if we're not seeing a positive response, but that's still really good information for them to have in going forward and making management decisions. So Absolutely. Uh, thinking about how can we leverage the technology that producers have, how do we set up these questions or set up these tests 
to really help us answer the question well and kind of going a little bit deeper into that question. You know, it's kind of the story of everything in agriculture. Of it might work for your neighbor, it might work for your, one of your farming friends, but you really want to make sure it works for you and your operation first and foremost. And so if you want to test some of these biologicals and they're your own fields, how do you recommend farmers start and what do they do to get results that could be useful to them? Yeah, so that's a great question. As I mentioned, it doesn't necessarily have to be complicated. And, um, you know, we have a lot of resources that can help producers think about how to set up these trials in their fields, but we, we definitely want to be having multiple replications looking at with and without the product of interest. We know that there's a lot of natural variability in a field, and so we need those multiple replications to be able to account for and know how much of the differences we might be seeing, I'll say, for example, in yield of the crop is due to that that product that we're looking at. Um, so we really advocate for people putting multiple replications in their field, uh, not just doing a half and half of the field. You know, you wouldn't expect the two halves of the field to perform uh, identically under the same management. So that really, you know, I think helps people understand why we can't really just split a field in half. Um, so we want people to set up strips and multiple replications of these strips in their field. Another thing that's really important, I think, is to think about what data you need to collect to answer your question. And so many producers are interested in yield and profitability, which makes sense. Um, but in other cases, producers might be really interested in diving in deeper into some of the claims around these products. Um, for example, is there enhanced root growth? Do we have better plant standability, uh, reduced lodging, things like that. So I think it's important for producers to really think about what matters to them. And so, you know, in some cases that really is of great importance to producers. You know, if we have a better plant health and have a better um, standability that, you know, impacts how our harvest goes and our ultimately probably our yield, but definitely how harvest it uh, goes for them. And so we need to think about, do we need to be collecting some additional data around that? Lodging scores, root uh, scoring. You know, if we're looking at a biological, do we need to be looking at, and this again, over a longer term period, do we need to be looking at changes in soil metrics, whether that's soil nutrient availability, soil health scores, and taking a look at that over, over time when using these products. Um, another thing that I think is really important as we're thinking about these products and setting up tests well is to have good communication with the, the company if this is a commercial product and make sure that the way that the tests are being or way that the products are being applied is as intended. You know, there's some different challenges sometimes with how products are mixed, what products they get applied with, the timing, the incorporation. And so we want to make sure that we're getting those products applied as intended or as the company has tested and specified. And so having a good communication with that maybe local representative or whoever providing that product to you, I think is really important as well. We know that there are similar on-farm research programs across the country, often sponsored by the regional land-grant university. Do you have an idea of how these programs are similar in nature to Nebraska's program and maybe how our listeners can get involved in their own on-farm trials in their own regions? Yeah, so there are a number of on-farm research programs, a lot of those through the land-grant university, some through commodity associations or commodity boards in the state. Um, so there are opportunities across the country for producers to be involved in these on-farm research programs. And, you know, they vary um, in how they're set up. Some are, you know, focused on kind of defined protocols that they provide to growers. And then others are kind of focused on more, I'll say, grassroots, like farmers can bring their own question. Um, our Nebraska program kind of has both. And so that's, uh, I think, kind of nice that we can kind of uh, support both approaches. So these, these programs might vary in kind of the flexibility that producers would have in doing a study. But um, I think regardless, our land grant system across the country really has great resources for producers to help them think about how to set up on farm research. And a lot of that information and resources are available online as well. Um, we have that information available online through our website and, you know, other growers, regardless of what state they're in, are, are welcome to be uh, utilizing that 
uh, information and guidance as well. Gosh, I know, Laura, it is so great to have the science behind these products explained for our listeners. And even though we cover biologicals in our role with Farm Progress, I know I really learned a lot today during our conversation. I'm sure our listeners did too. And if anyone wanted to follow up with you or maybe read a little bit more from the Nebraska On Farm Research Network publications, where can they get the information or how can they best contact you? Yeah, so our On Farm Research Network website would be the best place to go, and that's onfarmresearch.unl.edu. We have all of our research results published there. As I mentioned earlier, we have our results finder database that contains over a thousand on-farm research uh, results that can be filtered and searched through. We also have a lot of protocols available online that people can um, take and use regardless of where they're at and then our contact information as well. So uh, that would be a great place for them to go. And for anybody who wants to go access those websites, whether they're local to Nebraska or want to travel to attend those, just kind of see what's going on. We will have those websites linked in the episode description or the show notes below. Well, as we wrap up this episode of FP Next Deep Dive, we want to thank you so much, Laura, for joining us and for giving our listeners a little bit about your insights into this issue. Be sure to follow Farm Progress on social media to stay up to date with ag news and more and check out the digital edition of your regional publication at farmprogress.com. Tune in to our next episode of FP Next for our special Shop Talk episode where we'll preview the upcoming New York Farm Show in Syracuse, New York, which is February 22nd through the 24th at the New York State Fairgrounds, where we'll have our special guest, Chris Torres, who is the editor of American Agriculturalist, to give us a little behind the scenes look at the show in the Northeast and talk a little bit about agriculture in his part of the country. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to having Chris on the show. I worked with Chris on the new products team at Farm Progress Show a few years back. He's a lot of fun to visit with, and we're looking forward to learning more about the Northeast premier indoor farm show at Syracuse. Absolutely. Be sure to follow along with FP Next by listening and subscribing on your favorite podcast platform or at Farm Progress Online. And be sure to leave us a review if you enjoy the show. Only five-star reviews, though, please. (laughs) It's an important fact, right? Only five stars. Remember, if it's agriculture, your friends at Farm Progress have you covered. Here's wishing you high yields and good weather. We'll see you next time. 